Please join me in welcoming Virginia Madsen, Diane Ladd. Thank you. Nice full audience, that's really great. Thank you for being here. Not all my movies get that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions and then we have some microphones and you'll get to ask some questions, so we'll start thinking about that. Uh, I'm gonna start with Virginia because uh, the first thing we see in this movie is this great uh, soap opera scene um, <laughs> that your character, we later find out, is watching. Um, I love the setup, I love the opening. Tell us about your character, because your uh, Joy is a real person. I uh, happened to cross paths with the real Joy by chance in a, ho in a hotel on Friday night here in New York. Yeah, I just met her last night and her family for the first time, and apparently they called their mother Toots. <laughs> and I th thought that my character was, my character is mostly fictional, but they were very pleased that I got the essence of her. And, it, and the soap operas were really sort of the key to little Terry because She's a woman who is really, really afraid of the outside world. It's a big, scary, loud place, and she's very uncertain. So, you know, she wakes her daughter up, you know, to answer the door because it might be somebody scary or dangerous. And so for the soap operas, those are really powerful women and strong men. And, and so she, you know, they always know what to say. And, and they always get out of every jam. And she doesn't really see that her daughter is one of those strong women and her own mother is one of those strong women. And so it was, uh, I thought that she was a more of a tragic figure when I first started working with David. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't really realize till we started shooting that I was fun, that I was funny, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And and once we got more and more into the soap operas, and I was an obsessed soap fan, but and David knew that, so he got a lot of the soap stuff from me. And to have but Susan Lucci playing. Oh my God, I was so obsessed. Character. I was so obsessed. <laughs> Last night at the premiere, I was just like a ridiculous fan, and like every Instagram photo was Susan. But what David didn't know was that the wonderful Diane Lane, Diane Ladd, was in fact in a soap. So tell them. I'm laughing because I'm watching her watching the soap, <laughs> and he's doing all the soaps. And several years back, quite a few, I had started with Bob De Niro in a play off Broadway. And when it closed, I wanted to be a good wife, stay home and not travel so much and be with my child. And so I decided I was offered a soap opera, and I decided to take it. So I did, and I signed a contract for a year. And once I got in it, every every morning you rewrite, and they found out I could write. I rewrote 25 pages, and then we had to learn them. But that wasn't all it was. the s The soap opera was called Secret Storm, <laughs> but Secret Storm originally was called The Storm Within, brought to you by X Lax. <laughs> <laughs> True story. And one day the producer said, "What? We got to change that." So they did. So I did it for a year. So I was really having a good time <laughs> watching Virginia, watching the soaps. And sometimes it was hard for me not to crack up watching all this stuff. I sometimes felt very trapped in the soap, and I, I'm sure they do too sometimes. But I'll tell you one thing. People who watch soaps are really loyal. Diane Ladd got herself a 35 loyal million viewing audience that followed me from film to film. So I'm very grateful for that soap. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about, because Joy's a real person, as I said, I crossed paths with her this weekend, and um, just to give us a little bit of context, uh, tell us a bit more about the real person uh, and how she relates to the Joy we see on screen. Well, David, David always says that the story is about 50% true and 50% fictional, but everybody in the film really represents different aspects of her experience. And some of the craziest things in the film actually were things that happened, like you know, my ex-husband and her ex-husband living in the basement, the thing in Texas, 
all the people trying to take the business away. You know, her father and Trudy actually sued her, claiming they invented the mop and lost. She forgave over and over again. And so it's not so much a story of an entrepreneur, but a, a person who, it, you know, really triumphs. And no matter how many times she's knocked down, she gets up over and over and over and over again in order to follow her dream, a dream that she put away for a long time because life got in the way. It's interesting because it's a movie about, and I referenced this in the intro, about really crazy families, but... Uh, well, we all, we all have crazy that's families. That's everybody, right? <laughs> um, but it's also about um, really strong women and role models. Um, and I wonder if each of you could talk about the role that uh, strong women or ro role models have played for you at moments in your career or as you were trying to find your way uh, in your own career. Well, I had a nun <laughs> called Sister Mary Gertrude who, when I graduated from high school at 16, said to me, remember, Diane, perseverance is what counts. And I thought that she was cussing me out or something because I didn't know what perseverance meant. <laughs> Where but was this, Diane? Mississippi. My father was a, a veterinarian. And I think how I got this job, actually, life is so strange. And I love, the I love this film because it says to you, did you have a dream? Well, did you put it down? Did you lay it down somewhere? One of your dreams? Pick it up. Brush it off. And do it while you have breath in you. And that's, I think, we all need to hear from one person. And I had, I think, Virginia's mother did that for her probably, but my father did it for me. He was a veterinarian that traveled through five countries, uh, not countries, states. And I saw, s we were middle class, and he helped so many farmers. And I saw children in Mississippi who, forget, forget television, they didn't have a radio. And a lot of them didn't have shoes to put on their feet. And I once saw Indians cooking grass because they had nothing to eat. And I was very, very young, like six years old, and I knew something was terribly wrong in my country. And I promised God that if he would help me be a success, I would help his people. So I've done a lot of writing in that way. And my father said to me, Diane, you can do any damn thing you put your mind to in this world if God doesn't think it'll hurt you or take you down. He said, but remember this, the harder you work, the luckier you will get. So I have that inspiration. I think we all just need one person to talk to us, you know, to inspire us that we can do what we're supposed and to do. And that's kind of, that's really what you do in this film, which is, is so personal to you. That's what you do for joy. Well, David said that my character, he said, I'm not sure that she's really a human. She may be, she was an angel that came in to be born early to wait for joy, to help her fulfill her destiny, like Clarence and It's a Wonderful Life, because she sees in joy the potential of the magic. When it all goes to hell in the handbasket and they're all putting her down, saying, oh, it didn't work, when it doesn't work that first time and joy is crushed, the grandmother says, they're gonna give her a second chance. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. And she says, they are going to give her a second chance. She knows that, she sees, she knows. She sees what's in her. And the thing that was funny that I was just going to say, how I got this job <laughs> is that well, I met David at a party. A Colleen Camp, a good friend, had given him a party for the fighter. And I went into the party, and she introduced me to him. And he said, where are you from, Diane? And I said, Mississippi. <laughs> and he said, Mississippi, hmm. I said, do you know how to spell Mississippi? <laughs> He said, of course I can spell Mississippi. I said, let me see. He said, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-B-B-I. -S -S -I, -S -S -I, I said, mm-mm, mm-mm. He said, what do you mean? How do you spell Mississippi? And I said, in my crooked letter, crooked letter I, crooked letter, crooked letter I, humpback, humpback, humpback I. I. <laughs> <laughs> and he went all over the party doing that all night. Because he constantly <laughs> makes her tell that over <laughs> and, and over and over again. <laughs> and then later, Virginia and I, we had to improvise on the telephone. Oh we God, weren't sure so what weird. part we were up for. Well, I was in, I was in New York you auditioning. You were in New York this auditioning. Was, I think my third audition. And I was in a hotel room, like, 
doing improv and doing some stuff with <laughs> Jen <laughs> and improv with David, and he was doing this whole weird Meisner thing with me. And, <laughs> you know, I was just going with it because I was like, whatever he wants. And then he was like, okay, I'm going to put you on the phone with uh, the woman who's going to play your mother, and I, and I want you to tell your mother um, that you, you were afraid to go out. Now, mind you, we, didn't ha not, we did not have a script. There was no script for us. He would not give us a script. That's right. So he said, you're just like this Bellini. woman. You're really afraid to go out of the house, and, and your mother wants you to take the kid. And he's telling her on the phone, uh, you want to convince your daughter that to take the kids to the park in Virginia. You, you don't want to take the kids to the park because you're too afraid to go out of the house. So I'm like, okay. Now, so while, he, well while he's telling her that, in the meantime, I'd been contacted a week before Christmas, a year ago, and they said, Diane, David wants you to come to New York for a week and spend the week with Bob De Niro and him because maybe you're going to play his wife in the movie. Now, I, think, I, I don't know what part he was talking about unless he was talking about Isabella's role, which she's so much writer for that part than I am. So I didn't know what was going on, but I packed my suitcase and got ready. <laughs> and so meanwhile, you're going to screenings. And so I live by Santa Barbara in California. It's a two-hour drive there and then back. And so if I went to a screening, I it's seven days before Christmas. I've got because my suitcase. Because he might ask you all of a sudden to go. Yeah, like so now. I want you now. So I got my suitcase. And they'll say no next Tuesday or no. That's right. So I'm tipping everybody. Here, I'm going to give you 20 bucks. Will you watch my car? Because there's a suitcase in it. I spent two hundred dollars, <laughs> and so but anyway, I didn't go. go. But uh, then he so calls back. The phone. They said, "No, it's okay. It's Christmas. He doesn't want to take you away from your family." So then, right after Christmas, a couple days, he calls and says he needs to talk to you today at five o'clock. Right, right now. He said, "Oh no, wait, 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 he's delayed. Hold on." And uh, and what I had to do on the first time, he he does um, what do you call it when you put your FaceTime on the thing. He said, David wants to see you. I said, FaceTime? <laughs> My God, FaceTime makes you look horrendous. So I set the scene with the lights and propped up the phone <laughs> on the piano and did the whole thing. And so we had one FaceTime that was great. Now he says, I want to talk to you about it. I do it all again, and I'm waiting for the call. Five, they said, no, it'll be 5.30. No, now it'll be 6. Oh, well, he, he's busy right now. It'll be 6.30. Then it'll be 7. I'm so sorry, but it's going to have to be at 8.00. So I go over to the office, and it's terrible lighting, terrible everything, and the phone rings at 7.30, not 8, and he says, Diane, this is David. I need for you to do an improvisation. Okay, now here you are. You're going to talk to Virginia. And I thought, Virginia who? <laughs> what any kind of improvisation? What part am I talking to him for? And it said, okay, Virginia, talk to Diane. I was like, a, a mama? Yeah. What, uh, honey? No, what, honey? I just, I, 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 I don't want, can you take the kids to the park? I, oh, I, I can take them any time, darling. I, I can take them to the park. I, What's I wrong, go, honey? I can't go out of the house, Mama. You I can't go out of the house. I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid. You're too afraid, sweetheart. And so then, in the meantime, Open now that door and go I'm out. in this hotel room. Now, David, now Jennifer's sitting here, so he takes Jennifer, <laughs> and they go into the bathroom and shut the door, and he's going, keep going, keep going. And so now I'm just, like, talking to Diane Ladd on the phone, like, <laughs> For like <laughs> ten minutes, and I think didn't Alone. he put Jen yesterday on one of the interviews? You know, and Jen it said it yeah, that he well put he her he on he the put phone her with on me. And said you're six years I old. I thought so Jen I'm who? But then he I comes back in after ten minutes, and I'm like, <laughs> so he goes, give me the phone. He's like, okay, thank you, thank you, Diane. Lad, great respect. I have great respect and love for you, and I'll and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> and so I was like, so the oh, the model that of this was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's just whatever it is in life, go with it. Whoa. Sorry, that was a long story. Okay, Sorry, okay, God. <laughs> it's in your hands, okay. But we're laughing because they talk about different things. That when we all got together, Virginia and I and uh, Isabella had never worked with David before, but Bradley, of course, and Jennifer, of course, and who's a great actress. They're all great actors and actresses. And they, uh, Bobby had all worked with him. So Bobby said, just take it slow. He's a little different from like David Lynch or Martin Scorsese. Just go <laughs> slow with him. So we did, or we did not, or we did, Virginia. Um, we're going to go to the audience, but role models. I, I asked Diane the question. You didn't get the answer. Role models in your oh, life. Oh, certainly my mother and my you know, female role models, my mother and my older sister. Just very strong women and a great support system for me. And yeah. 
and uh, taught me everything I know. Uh, let's see what the audience wants to know. Uh, we do have microphones, and Jason has one of them there. Who has a question? Raise your hand. Where am I looking? Be brave. Yeah. Come on, come on. I know somebody has a question. It's just a matter of getting the first one out there. Anybody? Bueller. Right in front of Jason. Perfect Bueller. place. Um, you don't want to know what the weather was like in Boston? No. You want to know what David was like? You yes. don't want to know what Jennifer's Wait a like? Slow down. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I actually want to know something about you. you Wait, where you, are you? Both of you. I'm right here. Both of you oh. have worked with a, a number of directors on a number of different projects, long, big numbers. And I want to know how David Russell is to work with. You've described him in this little vignette as being somewhat difficult. You also said you had to go slowly. What does all that mean? No, I wouldn't say difficult. The experience can be difficult. Um, I wouldn't describe him as difficult. I would, I would describe David, at, like for instance, Jennifer says that you are the paint, he is the paintbrush and the canvas. I would describe him as kind of a, you know, we sometimes we say he's like a mad scientist, he's a genius, and, but he's also like a conductor. Mm. And he is a conductor and we are all, everyone on the cast and crew is like, the whole orchestra, every section. And he's conducting people and he gets more and more and more passionate as, as the piece goes on and he has the music in front of him. And if you do it right, we make beautiful music. We really did it right on this film. He wants us to create a symphony. And he cares very deeply. He sets the bar very high. So yes, he's very demanding because he wants you to be at your best. And it is the hardest job I've ever done. Well, but I, I just want to say the I best agree work that, it is, he that is I've ever done. Not yeah. difficult, but he's different. Each person is different. And that's why it's nice to work sometimes with directors that you have worked with before. When you first start off, it's like a relationship. You have to understand his rhythm or how he works. And I was doing a scene in a scene and I suddenly feel something odd and I turn around, there's David. I don't, what's he doing in my scene? <laughs> why, why is he, he's right here. Why is he in our scene? And he or he's like he right he there under the chair that I'm sitting in and I'm like. He gets so passionate. He gets so passionate and so inspired and he wants so much and he is a genius. He really is, he is a genius. And I'll tell you something, it takes a little while to connect and then once you connect, for me, and I think Virginia would say the same thing, that once he gets into your heart, he's there forever and a day. You know, we, we love him. And um, it was an incredible experience to be part because of this I film Because I think, you know, there's, here's what separates the genius from sort of like the difficult, uh, you know, crazy directors that sometimes we hear stories about because there's nothing dark about David, there's nothing abusive about what he's doing. He's not a narcissist. He's just extremely, extremely focused and has this very specific method, which now he's really got down. Really knows how to get in there with the actors. And so you just go with it and he, you, you end up trusting him implicitly. So and he writes part of the script as he goes. And you don't know, sometimes it seems it's like when Toussaint the plumber appeared. We didn't know there was a plumber. We, well, Jen and I are going, what He never plumber? told me there what was a plumber, plumber until he arrived. Yeah. You know, and then, then because he thought, well, Terry, l you know, lives in these soap operas. Well, she's got to have a soap opera come into her world and, you know, very frightening to have a man, you know, and then it's the first man who was ever really nice to her. And then it's romantic and, you know, so. That was a wonderful surprise. It was a great opportunity. I was, I was, I could not believe that David, uh, a couple stars, names were given to me, they shall not be mentioned, who he auditioned for our roles. And I couldn't believe it that these great stars that he had auditioned, auditioned, I don't want to say who they were, but he's very detailed and specific 
and very choosy about who he uses. And he's that way when he works every day. He comes dressed in a beautiful suit every day to work, like a new experience greeting you. And he gives his all. He gives uh, 150% to the film. And you use, he allows you, uh, as per other directors like David Lynch or Scorsese, to use a lot of yourself. And that's, that's uh, to me, a great sign of a great director. Okay, we'll take a couple more. We'll go up there, and then we'll go up. Good evening. Uh, I have a question for you. How does it feel to work on a, on a project with the Jennifer Lawrence? And she seems a very strong actress, and uh, in fact, uh, most of her roles, the majority, are about a very strong and solid woman. Um, is the she the same in, in life and uh, as a professional, as a colleague? How does it feel to work next to her? Well, she's a great actress, and she's a true professional, and she's an inspiration to the other actors coming up. I look around as an actress at the next generation, and I think, where where is the next Marlon Brando? Where is the next Betty Davis? And I do, if I do a television work, I get very disappointed sometimes in my fellow young actors that they're pretending they don't know the work. Uh, they are trying to all play camera angles instead of the work. And Jennifer, yeah, she, knows she's the work. she knows the work. She's, yeah, and she's, she's a really pro, and she's, she's there pro. on time. She's there on time. And also, it's a hell of a thing to carry a picture on your shoulders and to carry a picture of this size. And she does it. She does it. And she's down to she earth She does it with it. grace and dignity, and yet, you know, she... You know, because I, one of the things I love about getting to the point in, in my career where I am and being older now, that I love to mentor my young actors that I work with. And, and I was like, oh, man, she doesn't even need my advice. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> you know, no, really, because she already knew, man. She knew what she was doing at such a young age. And she still is very funny. And it could be very long hours of terrible, terrible blizzards in Boston and very long hours, as you can imagine, and people can be very tired and down, and 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 she just... She works like a dog. Yeah, she, she just, just gets, gets everybody going and keeps everybody happy, wanting to know if I wanted tea, and... She's very like down yeah, to she's earth. She's a woman of power, and, and, and rare at her age to really understand and know how to use her own personal I power. I think Jennifer Lawrence is of one her. of those actors that was consummated as an actor and given birth to become a better one. It's very sexy, Diane. I truly feel that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it, it depends on what your beliefs are in life, but I think this is a girl who's done this before and knows exactly what she's doing. And it was a privilege to work with her, for all of us. Um, she doesn't get caught in glamour and illusion, I'll tell you that, which is pretty nice. Uh, let's go up here to the front row. Yeah, um, I just wanted to hear, um, do you think David was more going to uh, try and convey uh, the concept of the American dream or like a strong, independent female figure kind of to get them in the space? Well, I think all of the above. I, you know, we've been doing some Q&As with uh, the actor, who uh, Edgar Ramirez, who plays her ex-husband, who remains her friend. And Edgar... It, you know, not his character, but himself in real life, he describes himself as a true feminist because this was a you know, story of a man who was man enough to hold her dream up and to support her after their you know, traditional marriage relationship was over. And that's true of her real life. So I would say all of the above, both her experience as a woman and also the American dream. And I think God forced us to bond because we went to Boston to shoot and it was 11 degrees below zero and nine feet of snow. And for three days, the trucks couldn't even get to us. So Edgar and I bonded. He was singing. And we were talking about, well, how does, how does your mother-in-law feel about you singing? And it was decided then. All of this time helped us. It really helped us get together and know each other. Some of us did know. I knew Isabella. I had history with Isabella, with Bobby, with Virginia. We'd worked together. But this getting into the part being trapped <laughs> with snow outside, I think um, sometimes your adversary can be your best friend. Which is kind of a good uh, analogy for the film because as much as the weather was very difficult and difficult on production, 
It allowed us to bond when we're snowed in in the hotel and all the streets are closed and the state of emergency is declared. <laughs> and it's also the same with the story of Joy herself, is as much as you know, Mimi is, is the backbone of the family and Mimi is the one person who helps her. But her adversaries and even her own mother teach her to be a strong, independent person you know, through that adversity. Because of the weakness of the mother, she has to become strong. I also met Joy last night for the first time. And her two daughters, Christy and Jackie, and there's a son named Robert, they came up and grabbed me and started crying and saying, you are our grandmother. And then I talked to Joy and I asked her, and she really went through, like that thing in Texas with that guy, wondering if he was going to kill her or what was going to happen. She did that. She, she used that strength. She was desperate. And she forced herself to take that step. And that's all real. It's, it's, you know, it's a movie, but it's based on a true foundation. She literally went through hell to get to heaven. And as an example for all of us, and what's a better movie at Christmas time than Joy <laughs> at Christmas? <laughs> Virginia and Diane, congratulations, and thank you for spending time with us tonight at the Film Society. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much. Thank God you. bless, and Merry Christmas.